As our next speaker today, we have nobody less than the actual inventor of CUDA mode, the fabulous Tim Detmers. So during his NeurIPS presentation last year, he described going into CUDA mode as working in highly efficient flow state, basically forgetting time and space and becoming one with the code. <laughs> Tim is not only an exceptionally good researcher and incoming assistant professor at CMU, but also an open source superhero um, who's rel relentlessly fighting for the GPU poor with his high quality open source quantization and sparsity contrib contributions, making deep learning accessible for everyone with production quality libraries like Bits and Bytes, for example. It is an absolute honor to have Tim here with us today. So let's give him a warm welcome, Tim Detmers. Thank you so much, Andreas. Uh, so whenever I give a talk like this, I try to uh, come up with something new you can't find online. And so today I want to talk about competitiveness in open source. And so this is a little bit maybe unusual sort of in the open source space. In the open source, we want to collaborate. We want to build on each other's work. We don't want to compete. Uh, but I'm also a researcher, and for me, I'm thinking about the future. And um, the worst thing you can do in research is work really, really hard on a problem that doesn't matter. And um, the same in open source. Uh, one thing that's not very productive is you work really, really hard on a feature that becomes obsolete. So that's why it's sort of also important to think about the future. And often when I think about the future, I think about how can be something competitive. And um, so um, if, if you think about back how open source was before this, stable diffusion, it was not much going on. When stable diffusion happened, everything exploded. It was this Cambrian explosion of collaborations, new projects. Uh, every day you went on Twitter, like stable diffusion got faster and faster. And it was exciting. And everybody knew it was just uh, a, a matter of time until this happens. Llama models. And then also the large language models exploded dramatically. And so that is what competitiveness looks like. If we can compete with closed source, we have this explosion of open source models and the entire ecosystem. It's a very rich environment. Um, but uh, when we look forward, uh, we probably not, will not see uh, GPT-5 level models open source. They're just too expensive. And so we need to think about what will happen then. How can we compete then? We don't want to be obsolete, but in open source we have strengths, and we can use these strengths to our advantage. And so I want to talk a little bit about different scenarios, and here I take a perspective from how can you view our competitiveness uh, from the perspective of open source. And I think there are three different scenarios. Um, if everything works well for open source, um, they solve all the problems, and they're very cheap to use, and everybody will use closed source solutions. And I will talk a little bit about what we can do in those, that scenario. Another scenario is there's closed source and it works really well, but it's really expensive. So that's an opportunity for the GPU poor to band together. And then the third, third scenario is um, where open source sort of wins. Closed source doesn't quite work. GPT-5 level models cannot and produce end-to-end -end automation, everything gets messy, and um, it might also be just too expensive to go further than that. GPT-6 level models will be expensive. So uh, let's talk about some of the details here. Um, closed source works and is cheap. If you look at that future, it basically looks like everybody will use the closed source APIs. That's the tool of choice. How can we compete in that environment? So um, if we think about the competitive factors there is one is sort of still privacy. Um, there will be a lot of people that still say, I will not say my data to this API, um, be it hospitals uh, or other sort of very privacy um, focused institutions, uh, but it might be also just users, like my personal data, oh, I will not send it to uh, some open AI API or something like that. Maybe you want to process on your laptop and that is a competitive advantage. So thinking about that, how can we make privacy a strength? Then also latency, they have physical loss. Um, the coast-to-coast -coast latency is 70 milliseconds, so the round trip is 150 milliseconds. Some applications are latency critical. Um, it might be sort of voice 
uh, um, but then also, for example, if you have tool use and the in-between in tool use latency is low because the tool executes quickly and the language model uh, quickly knows which next tool to call, you have a chain where latency becomes really important. And so for some uh, agent system where tool use is really important, these might uh, be better served on a sort of a local device that's close to where you actually make the API calls. So an API in the cloud might be too slow for that. That might be a competitive advantage. Then also the entire ecosystem. If you think about companies, they need to focus. They can't do everything. It's just too much. But we in open source, we can focus on all kinds of different aspects um, just by sort of separating it in different groups and then come together to build an ecosystem that's very rich. And another uh, competitive factor. So even if closed source is a tool of choice, we can compete by um, thinking about these competitive factors. Let's talk about closed source um, if it works, but it is expensive. This is the opportunity for the GPU poor because only the GPU rich or uh, and generally rich um, companies and consumers will be able to use these APIs. Um, so they use then these very expensive GPT-5 level or GPT-6 level APIs, but they pay a lot for that. Um, in that scenario, um, we, um, the, the sort of cheapest choice is always to use devices that you already have. And so I talked about privacy, and their laptops might be an advantage. But here it's also a laptop. You already own laptops. A lot of MacBooks, and these MacBooks are pretty good to um, run AI models. And um, you might think, um, in the future, we have these big models. Laptops can't run them. But think about O1. O1 is mostly inference. Um, you can get benefits like this from a small model that you run for a longer time on a laptop. I think it's very much possible. There might be also sort of mobile devices uh, in an uh, equation here, uh, but um, it's also a question, uh, what do we do with these AI models? It's not quite clear. And I think, um, if I think most use cases, they're still very useful on laptops, but the question is, what do you do on mobile devices uh, with AI? It's, I think it's not quite clear, but it might be an important factor where open source plays a role. Another thing, and, and that is sort of what I did with QLaura, um, if I tell companies, hey, I have this method, and now we can fine tune by using less GPUs, they say like, uh, okay, uh, I just use more GPUs, why, why would I use this? Uh, I already have enough GPUs. And so this is really a feature that's really good for the GPU poor, but the rich say like, I don't want to take any risk and have a quantization, I've trained in full precision on my GPUs. And so if we create features that are designed for the GPU poor, that's a big advantage for us, and um, that's how we can change sort of communities. So just thinking about, if you have a limited compute scenario, if you have a limited memory scenario, how would you change your approach? Um, that can be helpful to think about that. And then uh, often we think about efficiency if things are too expensive, but um, it's also the case if things are too expensive, then uh, people need to use open source. They cannot use the APIs because they're too expensive. And then one of the most important factors is just how easy is it to use the things out there. And uh, bits and bytes, I think a, a, a factor for its success was that it's so easy to use. Um, you can just say load in 4-bit and you got the model in 4-bit. And uh, thinking about how you can build tools that are very easy to use, I think that's a competitive advantage here. Um, okay, uh, let's talk about the scenario where basically open source wins. Closed models are not good enough, end-to-end -end automation will not work, and it's also really expensive to continue. And so I think that is actually a very challenging scenario for open source, because this is a scenario where open source needs to lead. And um, if you look at other companies like OpenAI, they try really hard to land products that people like, but it's difficult. And um, they didn't ship many things that are widely used uh, besides ChatGPT. And so here, I think one thing that we like to do in open source is ship dem demos. They look good. Uh, like, here, yeah, I have, have this framework and look what I can do. But uh, we need to go a step further if this scenario comes true. And I actually think this might be one of the most likely scenarios here. Um, and we need to really have um, um, solutions that work for businesses, solutions that are actually useful for individuals. A lot of how AI is used today is uh, we try to figure out what to do with it. Um, but we are not 
using it so much in our everyday work. There are some applications where it's very useful, but it's not as widely used as you think it would be after these large successes. And um, yeah, um, th then also sort of merit, um, we, we want to have solutions that really work and that really matter in the real world. I think um, and that, that's important. If you want to lead, you need to show that you actually can make a difference. And that is basically, we want to go beyond demos. Okay, um, that's everything that I have on this. Just here, the facets again, all sort of brought together. Um, so I have a little bit more time and um, other thing I wanted to uh, talk about is a couple of things that I sort of learned and observed in the last couple of days. And so there was a PyTorch conference and I was just amazed um, by how many people presented such uh, broad uh, uh, as sort of solutions uh, and with such deep technical depth. And um, so when I think about myself and sort of my strengths, it's like I'm a good CUDA programmer I'm a good engineer, and I know a little bit about research. And if I put all those together, it led to bits and bytes and a couple of innovations. Uh, but if I look at other people, they have so many strengths, um, and they know so much uh, th things about technical bits that I have no clue about. And so um, when I think about successes, it's about combining your strengths to make something unique. And you don't need to be the perfect CUDA hacker to have success. Uh, we are here for CUDA programming and systems programming, but you can take parts of that and combine it with the strengths that you already have. And I think that that's very powerful. So if you are not the best systems programmer or not the best CUDA programmer, um, that's okay because you have other strengths. And so think about that, how you can use it. And there's so many ways you, how you can com contribute to open source and, and that's quite powerful if you use your strengths. Um, the other thing I want to say is, um, if, if you sort of see things like Eulora and bits and bytes, it looks like, oh wow, there's like these big successes and they're these geniuses that build these things. But I failed a very long time. I, I learned CUDA for seven years. And I had many open source projects that absolutely failed. And bits and bytes is not my op first open source project. Um, in my PhD, I did four years of research and all my research projects failed. And it sort of, it took some time until I got there. And so if you fail, um, don't see it as you are a failure. Um, this is normal progress. It's really hard, particularly what you guys do, CUDA programming and systems programming. It's very challenging. And so don't be discouraged. Um, it's a lot of hard work. You need to gather the experience. You need to use your strengths. Um, but eventually, it ha will happen. Uh, there's a little bit of luck involved, and there might be a long streak of sort of failures, but keep up your hope. The other thing I think that's also related to that, and um, just seeing this entire community is just amazing. When I was doing CUDA programming like seven years ago, it was like um, I was alone. And now there are so many people you can turn to, you can build a community. You're not alone CUDA mode in the darkness and you're alone in your room. You're like here with other people. And so um, I think that's amazing to have this community. And I think there it's also important to just stick together and really support each other, uh, care for each other. I think that's one of the main sort of values of open source. Uh, we, we are not competing, we are collaborating, coming together. And um, um, how I can see it for myself, there's a long streak of failures that many people um, go through. People will try uh, and fail. And so be kind and support each other. I think that's important. And um, yeah, I think those are my learnings from open source and my learnings from the last days. Uh, that's everything that I have. Thank you so much.